Welcome to the third day of the SPR 2020 Virtual Conference. Um, we hope you enjoyed yesterday's program, I did, which highlighted our conference theme, Why Context Matters Towards a Place-Based Prevention Science. Yesterday's plenary session two was place-based prevention, and then the invited symposium, addressing the needs of neighborhoods and communities of concentrated disadvantage, a research and policy agenda was presented. And then SPR, um, the SPR Diversity Network Committee presented place-based approaches for health equity among members of marginalized groups, weighing reach, adoption, effectiveness, and scalability. And the ECPNs provided advice from experts on using existing data for research strategies for um, secondary data analysis. Um, the videos of all the live presentations will be available for your viewing in about a week. And today, in a second, I'll be presenting I'll share about today's plenary. And then this afternoon, Mary Woolley, the president of Research America, will give the presidential address. And lastly, there'll be the much anticipated SPR awards presentation. So, um, so today, um, I'm pleased to welcome you to our third plenary. It's titled Increasing Health Equity and Strengthening Resilience. The theme for today's plenary provides a platform for really stepping up our efforts to understand context as we move towards a more place-based um, prevention science. A strengths orientation for designing prevention and measuring change can provide connections between place and contextual factors such as culture and history in ways that reshape kind of def deficit-based habits of science. Um, the organizers for this plenary, which are listed in the program manual, um, are particularly excited about our panel and the perspectives and research they will share. Each talk will be about 20 minutes and then we'll have time for discussion questions. Dr. Robert Kaplan is Professor of Medicine in the Clinical Excellence Research Center at Stanford. And he will begin by reflecting on the evolution of public health sciences over the past 80 years and how the different areas are manifesting today. He will um, encourage us to think about what levers to push or pull in scarce resource context, building on the ideas from yesterday's plenary. Dr. Joanna Lee Williams is the Associate Professor in the Graduate School of Applied Psychology at Rutgers University. She also holds an appointment in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. The title of her presentation is Peer Networks in Place, Peer Networks as Place in Adolescence, Advancing Equity in Racially Diverse Schools. In her talk, Dr. Williams will share her research regarding race and ethnicity as a context for Encourage us to think about how bringing developmental science into systems can inform equity and in outcomes during adolescence. And then Dr. Melissa Walls is a Bloomberg Associate Professor of American Health in the Department of International Health at the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health. The title of her presentation is Increasing Health Equity and Strengthening Resilience, Lessons from Indigenous Communities. Dr. Walls will share her research expertise in neighborhoods, health and resilience among American Indian and Alaska Native communities. And she will encourage us to think carefully about specificity of measurement and generalizability of measurement in prevention in service of both scientific rigor and in service of social justice. So similar to the other plenaries, please enter your questions um, and react to others' questions because that'll lift them up in the discussion. And there's Melissa, yay! So I'm gonna hand it over to Bob. Well, hello, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm gonna spend my time today talking about um, just the view of how healthcare has related to changes in science over the course of the last century or so. So let me begin with just some disclosures. Um, as uh, Alita mentioned, I'm a, currently employed by Stanford University. I'm retired from the University of California system I'm also retired from the federal government where I worked at both uh, NIH and AHRQ. And I currently uh, do some consulting for Purdue University and from the Rush School of Medicine. So those are the basic disclosures, but there's a big one, which is that uh, I have a, a book that uh, came out uh, relatively recently that provides the foundation for a lot of what I'm gonna say today. So let me begin by just talking about eras of healthcare and how we've come to think about um, how we make populations healthier and how I think that that um, thinking has changed over the course of the last several generations, but we're still battling perceptions about how we make populations healthier. So one of the most important issues is 
uh, that we certainly know that germs cause disease. And in fact, um, we had sort of been drifting away from the idea that, that all disease comes from germs until the current pandemic hit. But there's been a lot of emphasis on if you want to make populations healthier, there's just only one way to do it, and that is to uh, attack um, microbes. Um, and this really started uh, in back in about the um, 17th century uh, when Pasteur uh, was able to, to show purification uh, of um, um, bacteria, identification of bacteria and techniques that would, would kill them. And as a result of the germ theory of disease, we developed what we call the first era of healthcare. So the first era of healthcare was place-based, uh, but it was really all about hospitals. And you can see on the left, on the left side of this slide, um, this is what hospitals looked like. They were sort of like factories. And you can see that, um, that beds are crowded together. Uh, people are in, in uh, units uh, that are very focused on uh, elimination of, of diseases caused by, by uh, germs. And the bottom portion of the slide, of course, shows that, that what, what hospitals look like. And the idea was that the time frame was short. Uh, people um, came to the hospital when they were very sick. Uh, the service was, was basically medical care. It was insurance-based. And the model was really an industrial model. Again, uh, making the hospital look somewhat like, like a factory. And the goal of all this was to, uh, to reduce deaths. And in fact, we have a lot of this still in what we think about uh, healthcare and the way we remedy health problems in the community. So, for example, the common narrative goes something like this. Uh, this is an ad from, from the Pharmaceuticals Manufacture, Pharmaceutical Manufacturers uh, Association. And that the narrative is that there's a very smooth linear relationship between bench and bedside. In other words, that you see this woman on the left uh, with her uh, gla lab goggles on. And then in this advertisement, the woman uh, next to her is a cancer patient. And the narrative that we provide for the community is that, that this person in the laboratory is working on a remedy which is going to, in, very, in a very short order, uh, address the health problems of uh, her colleague in the community. In fact, we see a lot of this. So uh, one time, uh, a couple years ago, I was asked to give grand rounds at the University of Toronto. And um, in, in my hotel room that day, they slid a copy of the uh, the Globe and Mail from Toronto under my door. And this was an ad that the University of Toronto ran um, that particular day. It said, cancer switched off here. The University of Toronto is the global leader in molecular cancer research. Um, and actually, when I talked to my colleagues that day, they, they said, you know, that wasn't us that made that ad. That was uh, that was the marketing department. We didn't, we really didn't do it. But the, but the, the ad was, you know, supporting this narrative that if you have cancer, you come to the University of Toronto, they'll sequence your genome and that they'll fix it. One of the issues that I get into in the More Than Medicine book that I mentioned earlier is how well are we doing on all this? So how well does the narrative that we provide for the community really work in terms of prevention of disease and, and promotion of population health? One of the things that, that uh, was presented when I was at the NIH, Mike Lauer, who's now the, uh, the, the um, uh, director of uh, extramural research at NIH, had a little blog. And he pointed out that about 70% of NIH grants or, um, are predicated on mouse models uh, or their mouse studies themselves. But one of the things that was emerging at that time was the realization that a lot of the basic science wasn't really producing the results and the replicability that, that they had hoped. So for example, it was pointed out that, that cell lines are often not what you think they are. So for example, you might as a basic scientist buy a line of guinea pig cells, but it turns out or, um, that they might actually be mouse cells because there's so much contamination in these laboratory samples. Um, and it turns out that in recent years, the major cell line repositories um, can be something other than you think you purchased between 14 and 30% of the time. And in fact, it's now there's advisories out for um, cell biologists that if you buy a certain line, you should hire an independent consultant to come out 
to authenticate that what you're studying is really what you think it is. There have been major problems in replicability. And so one of the big issues uh, that comes from sort of the, the basic science line is that studies um, don't always replicate what they're expected. One of the interesting examples of this was something that emerged when I was at NIH. I had the opportunity to serve on, um, on a committee on replicability, both at the NIH and at the NSF at the same time, when a lot of the replicability issues were emerging. What you see in this slide are studies uh, that were conducted by an ALS um, group that was interested in, in determining whether or not molecules that had been tested um, in uh, mouse studies um, and showed therapeutic benefit were easily replicable. So what you see is the sort of um, aqua-colored bars are the results of published studies um, in the literature. And then the black bars are exact replications of those studies um, investigating those same molecules. And what you see is that in all of, for all of these different interventions, uh, the, the therapeutic works very well. These are all mouse model studies. But actually the ALS group that went to replicate these studies was able to replicate the studies in none of the cases. And in several of the cases, the effect actually went in the opposite direction. A related issue is the issue of animal studies. And so we have great confidence in animal studies. And in fact, you hear this a lot, even with the new therapeutics that are being de developed for, for COVID-19. Somebody will report that uh, it looks very good in, in an early animal study. And this is, reminds me of one of my, my favorite quotes, which is, Norbert Wiener said, the best model for a cat is another cat, or preferably the same cat. Well, what could he have been talking about? Uh, again, when I was at NIH, um, I went and gave a talk one time, and the co-speaker in the session was Robin Barr, who at the time was the director of extramural research at the National Institutes of Aging. And Robin pointed out that we've cured Alzheimer's disease about 300 times in mouse models, but so far failed to cure it in any humans. And what he was referring to was a meta-analysis uh, looking at 221 consecutive phase three uh, placebo-controlled randomized clinical trials, evaluating the benefits of therapeutics for, um, for Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, the attrition rate for new drugs on Alzheimer's disease is, is substantial. It's about 96.6%. 96 uh, so very few of these promising molecules uh, end up being approved. And I'm going to come back to that issue later and then try to relate it to why we need to broaden our focus on social determinants of health. So one of the issues that, um, that comes up is we had this first era of healthcare. The first era of healthcare was based on almost exclusively the germ um, theory of disease. But science moved on. And I think it's important to, to emphasize that public health scientists have had a major impact on the way we think about uh, what happens in health and healthcare and what we need to do to move things forward. And one of the major things that happened was there was the Framingham Health Study and a variety of other major epidemiologic studies. And what we realized uh, when the Framingham Health Study was completed in, in about 1960 was that the big determinants of health were beyond germs. So germs are very important, of course, and we're learning that again with the current pandemic. But the Framingham Health Study made us recognize that the big factors that were associated with premature mortality were things like smoking, obesity, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, and infections, of course, were still important, and genetics as well. And so as a result of this new science, the emerging way of thinking about things from epidemiology, we had to redesign the healthcare system. And this brought us to the healthcare system that we have today. So the foundation, instead of being uh, just germs, was multiple risk factors. And we realized that we had to deal with health problems and public health problems using a longer time interval. So instead of the first era of healthcare, where it was really all about um, 
dealing with people when they were acutely ill. Now we had to think about what happened over this longer trajectory when people were becoming overweight or when they developed high blood pressure and the intervention points had to be in different places. And so what happened was that the place in which healthcare was delivered, as you see on, on the left, um, that it moved out of the hospital, or at least in addition to the hospital, it uh, moved to outpatient clinics. And the model for paying for it became prepaid benefits because that people wanted to get services before they were sick. And the goal of healthcare shifted to prolonging disability-free life. Now, I'm going to switch for a couple minutes just to talk about the sort of the basic foundations of the science. And then I'm going to come back to, again, how it relates to uh, current public health science and, and the broader determinants of health. So one of the big issues that we hear a lot about is mechanism. And so when we people talk about making people better, the first thing that, that you hear them say is, well, what's the mechanism? And the argument that we make is that well, this assumes that people are like cars. So if you understand what's wrong with your car, you can fix it. And so if there's a, a broken part or a damaged part, um, we can adjust that damaged uh, part. But the big problem is that cars were designed and manufactured by humans in factories, but human beings were not. And so the human body is the result of sort of multiple interacting systems. So the assumptions had to change. And so one of the big assumptions is that if you fix a broken part in the causal chain, everything is going to be better. And I just want to take a minute or two to, to just drift into that and explain why I think that this remains a big problem. So we think that if we can fix a risk factor, then we fix the outcome. And so let me give you the example of, of the, um, the treatment of uh, type 2 diabetes results from the ACCORD trial in which people were randomly assigned to a standard therapy or to intensive therapy. And you can see that those assigned to standard therapy, if you monitor their glycosylated hemoglobin, uh, didn't do as well as those assigned to intensive therapy. Um, and so we assume that this problem has been fixed because that the treatment brought down glycosylated hemoglobin. But if we look at outcomes, particularly on the right side, these are deaths from any cause. It turns out that deaths were actually higher in those in the intensive treatment group than in the, uh, in the usual care group. And I just want to mention that this is not unusual. So this is a study um, of uh, the CREATE trial uh, in renal disease. People were randomly assigned to um, group one, which was an intensive therapy these are people who were anemic, and the goal was to bring up their hemoglobin levels. And so that happened in group one uh, and did not happen in, in group two. But it looked like this problem was fixed. But the goal was actually to reduce the time at which people went on a hemodialysis. And what happened was those in intensive therapy actually ended up more likely rather than less likely to be on dialysis. There are just lots of other examples of this. Um, you know. Um, Stenting for lesions in the coronary artery. This is a, a NHLBI a little a graphic showing that uh, you uh, have plaque in the coronary artery. You can put a stent in, ex extend this uh, stent, and then this problem is fixed. But in fact, multiple clinical trials show that if you randomly assign people, people who do not have acute coronary syndrome, so that there's uh, certainly for people who are, who are at high risk for death, this, this doesn't apply. But for the most part, people randomly assigned to a stenting of their coronary arteries or optimal medical care, and then followed in this case of the COURAGE trial for um, between 2.5 and 7 years. And what happens is that if you look at all-cause mortality or um, um, survival from coronary disease, in fact, there's no benefit. And this, of course, upset the cardiologists, but in fact, uh, this has been in the literature for quite some time. The most recent uh, trial was reported at the American Heart Association meeting in November of 2019. And what happens in that trial, if you look from, at deaths from any cause, those randomly assigned to stenting or to coronary artery bypass uh, had a, a death rate of 6.5% uh, 
as opposed to 6.4 percent in the um, uh, in the ordinary or usual medical care group. Um, now, I just want to raise this issue with regard to our current crisis. Is that um, the last week uh, results from um, one of the, the major uh, clinical trials uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, about um, dexamethasone. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that dexamethasone does look like a promising therapeutic, but there's a bit of a problem because that um, rescue therapies work but may not work as well as the public has been led to believe. So if we look at this case, um, these are outcomes for various subcomponents of people uh, in, this, in this trial. And you can see that if you look at uh, for um, all cause mortality, uh, there was a benefit uh, for dexamethasone, but it was a small benefit. It was the difference in uh, mortality rate of um, about 22%, um, 22.9% versus 25.7%. And it was better for people on ventilators, but actually if you look at people who are not on oxygen therapy, there was a slight trend, although not statistically significant in the other direction. It's also worth mentioning that there are concerns about uh, therapeutics, and I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, about vaccines. And as we develop these, I do think it's important for us to get prepared for what might happen as vaccines are rolled out, hopefully in the relatively near future. So public expectation is extremely high. And that, uh, that what we've been getting in the news feeds is that early studies are, are extremely promising and there are no side effects. But actually, if you look at the publications that have come out in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, that it is true that uh, these um, early vaccine trials do show that there are increases in antibody levels. And that is, of course, the, the surrogate endpoint. But ultimately, we need to determine the infection rate. And we just don't know that yet and won't know that until these phase three clinical trials come out. But what we get is that there are substantial side effects and that uh, they're not serious side effects. But this slide shows from publication in the New England Journal last week that if you look at uh, um, side effects like pain, for example, that in fact, at higher doses, they occur in 100% of the people um, that, uh, that were subjects in these studies. By the way, there are only 45 people in the study. So I think that we need to get ready for messaging because as this starts to develop, um, there will be uh, resistance to vaccines and we need to figure out how as a public health community, we have to prepare the, the community uh, in an honest way for what might be expected, both in terms of uh, benefits and, and side effects. So I just want to, uh, in the few minutes left, I want to kind of jump ahead to, to uh, what I want to have as my major message. One of the things that I think is important to understand is that um, therapeutics typically fail in randomized clinical trials. And so, it's important to understand that although the traditional biomedical model works well, it doesn't work perfectly. And this slide comes from um, uh, Francis Collins's blog when I had first come to NIH. It's a realization that if you take 10,000 compounds, out of those 10,000 compounds, about 250 of them uh, will go from kind of the drug discovery phase to make it to preclinical studies. And that turns out to be about 2.5%. It's about exactly what you would expect in a one-tailed um, uh, significance test. And so about as many are succeeding as you would expect by chance. And then as you go from compounds that go into clinical trials in humans, only about five out of the 250 succeed. It's a little bit less than you would expect by chance. And then when you go from clinical trials to FDA approval, it gets a little bit better. It's about 5%. For some years now, we've been studying all the large randomized clinical trials at NHLBI. And one of the things that we realized was that, that before about 2000, most of these trials, or at least the majority of them, showed positive results. 
But then in 2000, um, we had the FDA Modernization Act. It created transparent reporting standards, initiated clinicaltrials.gov, and then NHLBI required all trials to be registered prospectively. And as a result of that, the number of randomized clinical trials that produce positive results decreased all the way down to about 8%. I'm going to skip ahead because I'm running late and because I do want to get to um, the major point that I want to emphasize today. So science has moved on another time now. So we, we had the initial phase, which was the, um, the initial phase, which was primarily emphasizing uh, germs. We had the second phase, which was emphasizing risk factors. But now science has, has entered a new era. So we realize, for example, that there are differences geographically and that risk factors actually are different in different places and for different groups. So what you see here is um, the, the red uh, emphasizes the areas where there's highest risk. So if you look at hypertension in white people, it's higher in the South. Uh, diabetes for white people, higher in the South. But if you look at other things, for example, uh, cigarette use uh, in African-American populations, it's actually higher in the Northern part of the country. And so as a result of sort of new science that comes from a variety of different areas, we realize that we have to develop now a third healthcare system, a different healthcare system that emphasizes optimal health. Um, the foundational theory is actually complex life course, place-based. We need heterogeneous services. It's prevention-based and so forth. And just to give you an example uh, quickly, um, if we look at something like um, the predictors of death, in the population, if you look at something like um, educational attainment, we had an opportunity to look at a big database uh, that uh, is um, run out of the University of Alabama in Birmingham. It turns out that years of education is a profound predictor of life expectancy. This is uh, unadjusted. If we adjust for demographics, um, it's still there. Um, so the, the basis is people with a college uh, who are college graduates or more, and then the black bars are less than high school. I mean, just for income, it still doesn't go away. Uh, all other biological risk factors, it doesn't go away. And then uh, behavioral factors, it attenuates, but doesn't leave. This is kind of the core of this new book by Deaton and Case, which shows that really the dividing line seems to be a college degree or not. So just want to say that when we look at these factors in relation to what we typically study in public health, pap smear, for example, um, where we debate endlessly about whether or not women should get a pap smear every year or every third year, it turns out that it affects life expectancy by perhaps a day or mammography versus no mammography. Probably looking at all cause mortality affects life expectancy by perhaps one month. Uh, cholesterol, a couple months, uh, um, systolic blood pressure about a year and a half, um, diabetes diagnosis versus normal about um, a little bit more, a couple years. But if we look at social determinants, high versus low grade employment, it's about six years. Smoking's at least seven and probably 10 years. Um, education, less than high school versus a graduate degree is about 12 years. And then in the map on the right, the place issue, living in Philadelphia in uh, by the Liberty Bell versus East Philadelphia, one zip code away is about 20 years. So I think I'll just sort of skip this to try to sum up, to say that um, we initially developed a healthcare system that was based on a, an acute infectious disease model. It was a germ theory based idea. And of course, we're dealing with that again with the, with the coronavirus. But time frames were very short. The remedy was always medical care. It was insurance based. The goal was just to reduce deaths. Then 
science moved along and it brought us to the second era of healthcare that was increasingly focused on chronic disease. It dealt with multiple risk factors. Timeframes were much longer. It was based on prepaid benefits and it was a corporate model. But now science has moved on another time. And I don't think this is what we recognize um, that we have new science, which is much more complex. It deals with life systems and courses. It deals with both social and biological sciences. Uh, it's intergenerational and it deals with the entire lifespan and it requires investing in population-based prevention. And the goal is, is to produce uh, optimal health for all. So again, thanks again for having me and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Bob. So now we'll transition over to Joanna. Okay. Um, thank you to SPR and to Alita for inviting me. Um, and thanks, Bob, for your presentation, which was very informative. Um, in the introduction before Bob's talk, Alita mentioned that I'm uh, a faculty member at Rutgers in the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology. Um, that's a new transition for me. I've been uh, at for 12 years in the School of Education and Human Development at the University of Virginia. Um, and I'm actually still physically in Charlottesville right now. Um, at UVA, I've had the pleasure of working with two centers, Youth Next, the UVA Center to Promote Effective Youth Development, and more recently, the Center for Race and Public Education in the South. Um, I'm fortunate to be maintaining these affiliations going forward as they each represent my central areas of interest around race in adolescence. So here's just an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, the first point I was going to only mention briefly anyway, but I think that Bob has um, essentially made the point for me, which is that educational equity is health equity. So I'm a developmental psychologist by training. Um, and in thinking about um, health and the focus of the session on health, I think the connections between education and health are clear. I'll talk also about how I understand race and racism as a context for development. Um, and then I'll hone in more specifically on the context of racially diverse schools. In the past few years, I've been focused on understanding students' social relationships in racially diverse schools. So I'll hone in um, even more specifically on peer networks as place. And then we'll close by talking about how we can promote network equity for all adolescents. So here is this first point. Again, you just heard about it. Um, in a really clear way from Bob, um, and that is that educational equity is health equity. Um, this image, which comes from the VCU Center on Society and Health, shows that education can create opportunities for better health, and that poor health can put education at risk, um, and that conditions throughout people's lives can affect both education and health. So it's now well established that education is considered one of the important social determinants of health, and there is really no health equity without educational equity. A central interest of mine is the role of race in adolescent development. And I generally think about race as a developmental context because race as well as racism operate on multiple levels um, in our everyday experiences. So we know that racial labels and categories are socially constructed, but the lived experience of race in a racially stratified society is real and meaningful on multiple levels. Race and racism operate at the level of systems and institutions, in interpersonal interactions, um, at the level of culture and symbols, so schools' cultural norms, for example, um, and as intra-psychological processes, like the development of an ethnic or a racial identity. In 1996, Cynthia Garcia Cole and colleagues introduced this integrative model of child development into the field of developmental science. The model recognizes that children develop in the context of social stratification. Race contributes to social position, which you see there in circle number one. And racism and segregation shape the quality of and access to resources and contribute to schools becoming promotive or inhibitive of healthy child development. 
um, at the micro level, which is represented in the circles on the right hand side of the model. Um, you'll see that family and individual practices like racial socialization and racial identity also matter, but naming racial stratification as a contributor to child's children's developmental trajectories was and continues to be a critical contribution of this model to developmental science. So I kind of wanna locate myself in terms of, of discipline. Um, I do study developmental psycho psychology, although you'll see throughout my talk later on, um, I also draw upon sociological perspectives. Before moving on to talk about the specific focus on racially diverse schools, I want to make this point as it relates to social position and racism. And that is that structural racism is a pre-existing condition that will exacerbate the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on educational inequality, having the most negative impact on racially minoritized and historically underserved youth and families. Um, I won't spend much time talking about issues related to the pandemic, but I do think it's um, important to mention, and I will circle back to this point again at the end of my talk. Okay, so now on to a focus on place. And as a starting point, I'm going to talk about the context of racially diverse schools. There is now a wealth of research um, showing that students who attend racially diverse schools have higher average test scores, they're more likely to attend college and more likely to choose to live in integrated neighborhoods as adults. Diverse schools and classrooms help enhance student leadership skills and can create more equitable access to educational resources. Attending a racially diverse and integrated school is also associated with reductions in racial bias and stereotypes, reduced racial disparities in educational achievement, and a lower likelihood of dropping out of high school. So as we think about education and health equity, it seems that the evidence suggests racially diverse schools um, are a context that's going to be beneficial. One of the long-standing barriers to racially diverse schools has been between school segregation. Um, this is a map of the state of New Jersey where I will be moving soon. It's also my home state. Um, and the color that you see on the image shows patterns of racial segregation um, between schools across the state. The darkest and the lightest areas are most segregated. So you can see some areas of sort of intense segregation, but at the same time, you can see um, areas that are more diverse. So there's a lot of um, school divisions that are in this kind of lighter pink shade, which means that they're more um, diverse in terms of student population. And we've actually made some great strides in, in increasing racially diverse schools. Um, but at the same time, recent evidence suggests that some kinds of school segregation have been increasing. Specifically, high poverty schools comprised mostly of students who identify as Black or Latinx are on the rise. Um, but fortunately, there are several methods that can be used to reduce school racial seg uh, segregation in localities um, and within school districts. The National Coalition Diversity recently, just in March, re, uh, released a policy brief documenting common integration strategies like controlled choice plans and magnet schools. They also talk about in their brief how and why school districts can include diversity and integration as an intentional focus of their Every Student Succeeds Act or ESSA plans. And they offer model school integration plans for states. The Supreme Court has declared that school diversity and the reduction of racial isolation are compelling government interests. And there's even been a congressional bill proposed to provide funding to support planning and implementation of school integration plans. It's called the Strength in Diversity Program or Senate Bill 3413, um, but it has yet to be passed um, as of the current moment. Um, of course, in thinking about increasing school racial diversity, that does require attention to place. There are certainly places that are, um, you know, the entire area is sort of racially homogenous, and that requires alternative solutions to racial isolation. Some have suggested that focusing on socioeconomic diversity will um, lead to racially diverse schools, and that is not necessarily the case either. Um, so there's more work to be done to thinking about um, continuing to increase um, 
contact between students from different racial or ethnic groups. Um, and that's really all I'm going to say when it comes to thinking about between school segregation, because I wanna talk about the context of schools that already are racial diverse and some of the challenges um, that happen in those contexts. Um, and that one of those is that a racially diverse student body is not necessarily an, an integrated one. Beverly Tatum, who is another um, psychologist and also most recently um, was president of Spelman College. She opens the fourth chapter of her book, Why All Together in the Cafeteria with the following observation. She says, walk into any racially mixed high school cafeteria at lunchtime and you will, you will instantly notice that in the sea of adolescents, there is an identifiable group of black students sitting together. So on the one hand, while cross-race friendships are more likely to occur when schools are more diverse, lots of studies show that same-race friendships are quite typical and actually more likely than cross-race friendships. Just because you bring kids from different backgrounds together doesn't guarantee they will interact with one another. Sociologists refer to the tendency of people to hang around with others who are like them as homophily. Um, there's multiple reasons for racial homophily and friendships. I'm going to go back to um, this slide because Dr. Tatum talks about many of these um, in her book. During middle and high school in particular, being around racially similar others can provide a sense of identity safety and create a context for building a positive racial identity. This is especially meaningful for students of color since having a sense of racial or ethnic pride can buffer against the negative effects of discrimination that many of them experience in schools. Adolescent social interactions, which occur in relational networks, are affected by status and hierarchies, where some youth and some groups are valued differently than others. These social interaction patterns create and reinforce rules about who is allowed to interact with whom and how kids from particular groups should behave um, or even dress or talk. Um, we don't often, I think, think about the power of middle school or high school in this way. Um, but these peer norms that get enacted on a daily basis have the capacity to reinforce broader systems of racial ethnic inequalities as youth grow up. As sociologist Gary Fine writes, groups not only knit together, they also divide and stratify. Groups can build or reproduce social divisions. Groups do not welcome all, but they frequently replicate relations and culture. Group boundaries reinforce differentiation and structural discrimination. Um, recent advocacy work by Youth from Integrate NYC, which is a youth-led organization that stands for integration and equity in New York City schools, recognizes that both things like resource allocation as well as relationships across group identities are essential components of meaningful school integration. So relationships really do matter. My own work has focused most recently on the context of middle so we know that the middle school transition often brings with it um, an increase in racial ethnic diversity as students move from neighborhood-based elementary schools into um, a larger context. Also, in the context of early adolescence, youth become particularly sensitive to social relationships and social status. During this time, they're making sense of their personal and social identities, including what it means to be a member of their particular ethnic or racial groups. And socially, this becomes a time when we observe increased affiliation with same race peers and racial homophily in peer networks, which I mentioned earlier. Bringing this together in the context of middle schools, work by David Yeager and colleagues shows that in concert with biological and psychosocial changes of early adolescence, youth of color often become particularly attuned to the school racial climate and related racial dynamics. In early adolescence, peer groups take on an increasingly central role. Um, another sociologist, Bonnie Erickson writes, variety is the key. No, knowing many kinds of people in many social contexts improves one's chances of getting a good job, developing a range of cultural interests, feeling in control of one's life and being healthy. So it's important to kind of hone in on social networks um, and we can do that through social network analysis. Social network analysis allows an examination of connections between students and takes the dynamic nature of groups into account. Drilling down into social network dynamics allows for a close examination of how resources flow between students. 
So as I think about peer networks as place in adolescence, um, it incorporates my own lens as a developmental psychologist with a social network perspective. I'm going to briefly discuss findings from two recent sets of analyses, one focused on peer groups in rural middle schools, and the second is based on pilot data um, from an ongoing study of classrooms in a racially diverse middle school. So the first sample included youth from eight middle schools in rural localities across the United States. While a few of the eight schools had students from three or more racial or ethnic groups, most had representation from only two groups. And this always included white students um, and students who were black, Latinx, or Native American. Um, we calculate diversity in this study, the Simpsons Index, which accounts for the number of different racial or ethnic groups and the size of each group. Um, the score, which ranges from zero to one, represents the probability that any two randomly selected students will be from different um, racial or ethnic groups. So higher scores indicate higher levels of diversity. Um, these middle schools, as I mentioned, um, were only modestly diverse. On average, the schools had a Simpsons index of 0 0.40. And peer groups, which um, on average were made up of about six to seven students, um, were even less diverse with an average um, index of 0.2. <clears throat> so, in examining associations between peer group diversity and teacher ratings of student social and academic competence, we found that Black, Latinx, and Native American students in more diverse peer groups were rated more favorably on social and academic competence than those who were in homogenous peer groups. Notably, given the racial composition of the schools, the diversity of the peer group for students of color was driven um, primarily by having white friends. In contrast, for white students, we found that teacher ratings of social and academic competence were not related at all to peer group composi composition. So there were some associations between diversity and outcomes, but they were conditioned on students' racial group membership. In the next study, which is still ongoing, uh, we collected pilot data from sixth and seventh grade classrooms in a middle school with a high level of diversity. Students in this school generally identify as Black, Asian American, Latinx, multiracial, or white, and the sample diversity index is 0 0.80. So it's a, it's a school with a lot of racial and ethnic diversity. One of our interests for this project is on how central students are in the classroom network with a focus on the social network, so like who's considered popular in a classroom, um, and on the academic network, so who might be considered to be a good student um, or really good at the subject area. So we asked students to nominate peers in one of their classrooms. What we found so far as we begin we've begun to analyze our pilot data is that on average, white and Asian American students are significantly more well-connected than students from historically underserved racial and ethnic groups, including African American and Latinx students, in terms of both the social and the academic network. Specifically, white and Asian American students in the sample receive significantly more peer friendship nominations and social influence nominations, as well as significantly more nominations of who students like to work with and who they go to for help. Students were also significantly more likely to be perceived by their peers as academic experts. Um, other preliminary analyses suggest that differences in students' connectedness also matter. And I think this is critical for thinking about educational outcomes. Students need to feel like they belong and that they're engaged in and connected to school in order to be successful. So we find that students who are more connected or central in the classroom academic network report a greater sense of belonging and less academic disengagement. For Black and Latinx students, being central in the academic network in the academic network seems particularly important for belonging and engagement. Um, as this project advances in whatever that looks like as we navigate um, you know, students being in school from home, most likely, um, we will focus on identifying classroom network features that provide the most equitable learning opportunities for historically marginalized students. So for example, if we look at the whole classroom, we can look at the level of you know, sort of overall cohesion and integration versus schools that are classrooms that may be more hierarchical or cliquish. Um, we also, in the future, will focus on how instructional practices relate to um, network dynamics. 
So we know that racially diverse secondary schools hold promise for offering academic and psychosocial benefits to the students who attend them. Um, at the same time, though, realizing the benefits um, requires an equitable distribution of power across groups. Our findings suggest, and perhaps this is not surprising, that power is not equitably distributed across students in our two samples. In the mixed race rural schools, Black, Latinx, and Native American students with same race peers were rated less favorably by their teachers. And in diverse classrooms, Black and Latinx students have fewer connections and influence and are less likely to be considered academic experts relative to their white and Asian American peers. The concept of social network equity is characterized by interconnected and evenly distributed social connections. Network equity permits access to and exchange of resources. And an important question that remains is how can we promote network equity in racially diverse schools? One starting place would be a closer examination of peer networks in diverse schools. There's um, strong evidence, as I've discussed already, which suggests that classroom relationships are critical to student success and employing social network methods at the peer group level and classroom level can improve our understanding of local dynamics. Um, the goal here would not necessarily be to come up with generalizable solutions um, for all schools, but to instead identify opportunities for acute interventions that may shift the trajectory of a specific classroom in a given school year. And there is evidence suggesting that interventions targeting peer relationships and peer networks can be effective. Um, for example, DeLay and colleagues found that a relationship-based intervention decreased um, classroom and peer network segregation and improved um, academic outcomes. So social network interventions have also been used to change student health behavior and school-wide behavioral norms. And I think that there's more work that we can be done to, that can be done to sort of think about how to use them in the context of schools. A second target for promoting network equity um, is teachers. Given the importance of social relationships in adolescence, training teachers to understand network dynamics can be beneficial. For example, Tom Farmer, Jill Hamm, and colleagues have demonstrated that helping teachers to recognize and manage middle school social networks can promote academic success in under-resourced rural communities. So if teachers are really attuned to some of those dynamics that I mentioned earlier, then they may be better able to support kind of um, promotion of network equity. Um, another approach that is also focused on teachers and instruction is identifying the instructional practices that support network equity. For instance, Amanda Kibler, who is a former colleague of mine from UVA, um, and other colleagues found that offering praise and validation, personalizing interactions with students, and assigning complex tasks for peer collaboration were common teacher practices in linguistically diverse classrooms with high levels of student integration. So in those classrooms where students are really well connected, they identified a particular set of practices that were not as common in classrooms where students were really disconnected from one another. Finally, as I stated earlier, adolescents, particularly youth of color, are often attuned to the school racial climate and related dynamics. Um, their meaning-making processes can filter social networks and networks can influence student decision making and access to resources. So school curricula and school racial climate may be important targets for promoting network equity as well. Sociologists like Prudence Carter, Amanda Lewis, Carolyn Tyson, and others have documented how students understand the racial messages conveyed in their schools about who is expected to achieve. Similarly, there's evidence that curricular approaches that affirm students' racial and ethnic identities can support academic success and send messages about whose experiences are most valued in the school. So at the start of my talk, I made the point that educational equity is health equity. As depicted in this diagram, relationships and networks play an important role in the association between um, education and health outcomes. Systems of power are also central in shaping life trajectories. And in focusing on networks in racially diverse schools, we can better understand how these two are interrelated and contribute to health and education outcomes. 
To close, I want to return to an acknowledgement of structural racism and its role in exacerbating the effects of the current COVID pandemic on educational inequality. Um, I recognize that relational networks are only one factor among a larger set of complex issues that impact educational outcomes. Um, but again, as a developmental psychologist, I also recognize that relational networks play a central role in the experiences of adolescents. So as we consider how to best serve youth right now through an equity lens, it's important that we don't overlook social networks and their potential for amplifying or mitigating opportunities for youth to thrive. Um, I will close there by saying thank you for listening, and I want to acknowledge um, various iterations of my research team over the years, as well as the William T. Grant Foundation for the support, um, their support of the work that I discussed. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joanna. Exciting. So now we're going to move over to Melissa's talk, and um, there she is. Take it away. All right. Hi, everybody. I wish I could see everyone. SPR has become one of my favorite conferences, and I miss you all, whoever's out there. Um, and Alita, thank you so much. Bob and Joanna, thank you. I, As I was listening to you two speak, I jotted down a few pieces of synergy across our talks. One is um, I think all three of us are being very critical of business as usual, and that's exactly what my talk will do, I hope and um, really emphasizing the complexity of human life through life course and developmental perspectives and, um, uh, and, and leading with equity first. So um, I'm Melissa uh, Buju, hello. Um, I am Boys Fort and Kuchiching First Nation Ojibwe on my mother's side, German and Swedish on my father's side. And I'm so grateful that uh, some of you showed up today online to join us. Um, I wanna start, this conference is about place. So the place that I'm at is a town called Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, this is our iconic lift bridge. And the water you see here in the land that the buildings are on are the traditional uh, and contemporary home of Ojibwe people. Before that, Dakota and Northern Cheyenne people. And you may be hearing at conferences and events, people really acknowledging indigenous land um, presence and history in places um, across the world. And I, I strongly encourage all of you who are listening to Take a moment to download um, an app. It's uh, native land on your phones and in it, you can basically click in it to see who the indigenous people of, of any territory of any place in the world that you are, were and are. And doing that, you can acknowledge how you, we systematically benefit from living on land that was in some cases stolen, some cases ceded through, um, through treaty. Um, and I just thought that in a conference about place that this should be should be central to all of our thinking. Uh, speaking of land, um, if those of many of you don't maybe don't know this or maybe some of you saw it, the Supreme Court made a massive decision on July 9th. So two of us in this uh, session have cited the Supreme Court. Uh, on July 9th, Oklahoma, about half of Oklahoma was given back to five um, uh, tribal nations. And um, there's a lot of complexity to this decision and a lot of consequence, which um, I think is really great. If you want to learn more about it on your uh, pandemic neighborhood walks, I recommend this podcast called This Land. It's a short little, I think, five or six, maybe seven episodes. And um, I've been listening to them as I take my neighborhood walk in the evenings. Um, so there's a little something for you to do outside of working. So I want to, uh, in the talk today, I'm going to talk about indigenous health and indigenous perspectives on prevention science. And when I say indigenous in this presentation, I'm mostly talking about American Indian and Alaska Native people. And I am talking from the perspective of one person out of hundreds of people who are on our research team. So I am just one voice among many. Um, some of our team members are shown here and here. And so these wonderful people who have been my colleagues for about 20 years now um, are out there collecting data, doing all sorts of um, community-based intervention and preventive work, and really are my colleagues. And I'm grateful to them for allowing me to have um, the platform today, but know that I am, again, just one voice of this very large team. 
So my major topics for today, I want to focus a little bit on historical time and place very briefly, and then just share with you some examples of <clears throat> centering strengths in Indigenous research. You know, this session is about resilience, and I think the three of us today are really focusing equity in this conversation. And then through this pandemic, I found myself really frustrated with um, the rollout of federal, state, local response to the, um, to the crisis in terms of funding and allocation of resources. And it's really made me step back and think about our work and how we can interrogate the assumptions of science, uh, as Bob really did at the beginning of this talk um, or this session. And I'm just going to share a few examples of how that's popped into my head. Um, and if there's one message I would love for all of you to take from this discussion, it is that just because I'm talking about research with indigenous communities um, doesn't mean there are not implications for all human health. And, you know, for so long, we've listened to science that has been conducted on or with white European ancestry, um, the people of European ancestry populations, often college students, and assumed that those findings generalize to all humans and really rarely critique that. But um, if, if, you know, that assumption is false, but also uh, I think there is some humanness to all of us. And I think that the lessons from Native communities can apply to a lot of your work, even if you don't work with Native communities. So, so please keep that in mind that we are not just a special population to be put um, sort of on the side. So a lot, I, I think both Bob and um, Joanna maybe mentioned, or at least Bob, uh, life course perspectives and Joanna developmental perspectives. So in my training in graduate school, we really read Glenn Elder um, as kind of a foundation of, of life course perspectives and this idea that he had about historical time and place and that all of us, all of our lives are situated in and influenced by the historical time that we are born into, that we live through, the momentous events that occur during our lifespan, one of them happening now, and more, um, I think, critically, especially from an indigenous perspective, all of the points in history that led to this moment in time, right? The point is that historical events, court decisions, treaties, traumas that our family members experienced, all of those things link are linked together to influence where we sit today, how some groups are systematically privileged and others disadvantaged. And if we keep that in mind, um, equity and inequity becomes you know, pretty crystal clear. These things emerge not out of a vacuum, but because um, they were designed to, we were designed to be unequal uh, given this history. So in native communities, you would be hard pressed to talk about health without someone mentioning this term historical trauma. I am not going to talk at length about historical trauma or really at all. It's, it's the own sort of topic and really has to do with the intergenerational accumulation of exposure to and experiences with traumatic events. A key characteristic is that these things in Native communities are um, experienced often at a group level or at a collective level. Things like children being removed to boarding schools, um, probably most infamous is the Trail of Tears, you know, so removal of Native communities to reservations, relocation era movements, moving us from reservations to urban areas and then back again, um, and all sorts of other kind of um, historically rooted traumas that have intergenerational consequences. Uh, and an important thing that Karina Walters, who's one of our colleagues, points out is that these things don't happen on accident, right? These traumas were actually government sponsor sponsored and sanctioned, and um, and so they are not accidental or acts of nature, for instance. Um, so historical trauma uh, is a key determinant. We many of us argue a root determinant of indigenous health inequities, but it also feeds into the ongoing marginalization of Native people. So. What are indigenous people in America today? What are we, right? We're very diverse. There's 574 federally recognized tribes, but most native people live in urban areas. Um, differential language and culture bases, different social determinants of health across communities and different rates of health and equity across um, tribal nations and urban Indian uh, communities. Ongoing marginalization rears its ugly head in so many ways. So very recently it took, you know, a worldwide movement for our national football team to finally change its racist mascot name. But there are hundreds, if not thousands of more 
small town and national mascots that um, continue to perpetuate stereotypes about native people as invisible, as romanticized feather in head types of people. And these issues certainly affect our health today. But this talk, this session is not about trauma and marginalization and at its core. It's about survivance, strength, and resilience. And um, so I want to make sure that I center some of these um, as we move forward. So what is survivance, by the way? I had that word on the last slide. Uh, Gerald Visner is a native scholar, um, an indigenous studies scholar, and he talks about indigenous survivance as an active resistance um, you see Native people standing up against pipelines. You see Native people in Congress. You see Native people as doctors, lawyers, teachers, leaders. That is who Native people are. Um, too often, our, our focus on historical trauma and marginalization, although important, undermines the truth of the activism that happens in Indian communities. Um, and so this idea of survivance really um, highlights the potential, uh, the fact that our ancestors did not idly sit by as we were marched across the country, as we were, our family members were killed. They actually engaged also with um, government leaders. That's how treaties exist. There are hundreds of treaties on the books. And so we have um, very active, not passive leaders historically in Indian country and today. Um, we also need to just, I think, so in addition to shifting narratives away from victimary status to that of survival and, and resistance, we need, we need to smash so many stereotypes. And um, many of those center around substance use, which is something that I happen to um, focus a lot of the, the, the studies that I'm involved with on. Um, and I'm not going to go into great detail about substance use today, but I'm gonna give you an example of, um, of how that works in terms of the narrative of mental health. So really briefly, the red bars on this chart represent a measure called the positive mental health um, continuum short form. It's this idea that you can measure people's flourishing mental health status. And so the red bar are people who are flourishing, not languishing. So it's a very positive measure. The first two studies listed on the x-axis are studies that our team has led um, in the Midwest and in Canada with indigenous communities. And, what, and the two comparison studies are non-native groups. So the comparison study 1A is a group of college students and the second one is um, a national sample of, of adults. What you should notice is that our native um, participants who actually happened in both of these studies to be living with type two diabetes, a chronic condition that we know um, increases risk of um, poor mental health, that these folks are reporting levels higher than or at least on par with healthy white samples of people who don't necessarily all have a chronic disease. That's a significant strength. It was replicated across two studies and I've um, consulted with other colleagues using similar measures that when we do assess positive mental health, our numbers are quite high in native communities. At the same time, our rates of depression or depressive symptoms, which were measured variably, variably across these studies, are also higher than in comparison groups, which represents a little bit of a paradox, but when I ask elders um, on our team, what accounts for this? Why are we both sad and happy? They just said, because we are. <laughs> and I thought, well, oh, touche, so be it. Um, but I think the main point for me for today about this particular bar chart is, as you have heard, you are what you say you are, or as anthropologists say, you are what you measure. And so many times, the only thing that I've measured in studies or that the people who trained me measured in studies or that we publish in journals are these dark stories, the story of depression. And when we do that, we're sending out a narrative. That is, we, if we are nothing but sick, destitute, dying people, what in the world would you have to learn from us? And I want you all to know that Yes, we experienced the highest health inequities in this country, but we have so much to offer and so much to teach in terms of resilience, strength, and maybe a new direction in that third wave of medicine that Bob was talking about. So in addition to shifting narratives and interrogating the assumptions we have about you know, strengths versus deficits and, and all of these things that I just mentioned, I wanna focus in for just a second on community engagement. I bet we could go through the program and count thousands of instances um, at SPR and other conferences 
a growing awareness of the importance of community engagement and health equity and, and frankly in all research. I think it addresses some of the issues of validity and um, generalizability that you know science, is, uh, str science struggles with. I want to just highlight the voices of these three women, Sharon, Ivy, and Michelle, who are my colleagues in the Robert Wood Johnson um, IRL program. It's a leadership program. And they gave the, the most um, compelling webinar a couple of weeks ago about their work in the Washington DC area with youth. And my, um, my takeaway from what they were saying is something that, again, we see echoed in conference agendas all the time, that community engagement matters. But they had such passion and precision with what they said in that culture, place, and community strengths are the active ingredients for change, for health equity, for prevention science. And I really just encourage all of us, myself included, to interrogate our assumptions about community engagement. And I use air quotes on purpose, right? What do we mean by that? Um, is it, it's, it's of course not just an advisory board. It's, it's about language, it's about relationships, it's about who do we um, privilege in a conversation? Whose perspectives make it into a journal? What is it that um, what is it that truly matters when it comes to improving human health? And when we truly center um, community engagement and community leadership, um, I think innovative things happen. And um, some of you have seen this. It's been going around on Twitter. It's a uh, it's an editorial that just came out like just now um, or last month, and it's called "How Not to Write About Global Health." So I encourage you to look this up. It's it's satire, and it it will both make you laugh and I hope make you feel uncomfortable about how we all have to do better when it comes to community engagement. And so I'm going to leave this teaser, but my last slide today will give you two highlights from this article that I thought were nice take home messages. So I mentioned innovation. If we um, if we really lead with equity with an equity lens and an equity lens encourage us again to interrogate assumptions to not keep going down the same path we've always gone down. If we do that, what I have really experienced with our uh, communities is that um, wow, do we innovate? Uh, and you know, in science, we want to be innovative. Um, and I think. What's, what's really fascinating to me is that our community teams will not find a topic innovative because it's community knowledge, sometimes indigenous knowledge that has been around for time for forever, right? Um, but we as scientists sort of get excited about new ways of measuring and thinking about things. And so I wanna share with you just one example. Um, I, I do have many, many examples, but I know for the sake of time, um, I had to whittle it down to one. So. Um, I'll try to explain this. I wish I was with you all so I could sort of walk through and see where everybody's sitting. But um, the bottom line is look across the x-axis here. You see a bunch of indicators and these indicators are uh, various measures from a project that our team has been um, involved with where we collect data for the past almost 20 years now um, annually from a cohort of American Indian and First Nations young people who they were 11 when they started the study. They're about 30, 30 years old now. And so in some of our more recent waves of data collection, we've been really trying to expand what we consider um, social cohesion, sociocultural integration. And so these are some latent class analysis results where measures like social support, um, which are rampant in the literature, right? Like we've known for decades and decades that social support is good for human health. Um, we really wanted to see how do those hang or not hang together with, um, with other measures. So you've got multicultural mastery or multidimensional mastery. So this feeling like I can do this. I have, um, I have the ability to get this done with my friends or my family. We have a measure of cultural identification. This is positive um, ethnic identification. Um, a reverse coded indicator of loneliness. And then this measure from some colleagues at, um, in Alaska that comes from Alaska Native perspectives on connectedness and this feeling that we're connected to each other, to nature and others. What a latent class analysis will show you is how um, various kind of classes or groups of people pop out in your data based on how they respond to these various indicators. And so what you can see is that at the bottom with the circles or the light blue color, um, that group we're calling kind of a low integration group. They're still doing pretty well. They're moderate in terms of their ratings of giving people support, feeling connect culturally connected, but they're also reporting, a, um, uh, you know, more connect uh, or less connectedness and uh, less social support. 
The people at the very top, of course, are high on all of these measures. The little boxes here are just sort of there from our team, Dane Hautala, who's a, one of our analysts, put those there. He, uh, it helps us to sort of eyeball where, where these classes are hanging together or where they're kind of different. Um, and so if it helps you, it, it's sort of just a visual marker. What I wanna say about this is not so much about the classes. Well, first of all, the second, the middle class is the highest or proportion of the sample, about 50%, and then the other two um, fall into the 20s somewhere. Um, but what, what I love about this model is the innovative expansion of, of social support, the innovative expansion of what do we mean about the complex world of human health, as Bob alluded to, right? It's, it, in a basic intervention, we often want to increase social support, but what these classes tell me is that it's, it's more than that. And people actually in indigenous communities often say, our culture is our medicine, our culture is our treatment. And we find evidence of this up and down the board. But what's going on with this bottom class? They seem to be engaged in culture, but they're not, they're not getting the support and they're not feeling that connectedness. And does that have implications for their health? And it, it turns out it does. So these classes map very neatly, almost in a linear way, actually in a perfect linear way, um, across uh, their self-rated physical, mental, and spiritual health. They, um, we see much differentiation between the low and the high group in terms of their, whether or not they abstain from marijuana, methamphetamine, and heroin use in the past year. So I'm not gonna go into the details here. These are preliminary analyses, but what this suggests to us is that these innov innovative ways of measuring could add precision to the way we think about the complexity of social existence. And indigenous perspectives, community perspectives, are what drove selecting these measures at the bottom of the, of the latent class analysis here. And our community teams adapted the heck out of these measures. You know, they changed them to fit local context. And um, that led to innovation, and I think will lead to innovation in the way that we design a current intervention that we're working on um, to work in a holistic way on diabetes care. So I promised you, um, I don't want to put that up yet. I promised you I would uh, end my talk today with um, some favorite little excerpts from that editorial that was recently published. So the first one is this. Remember, whatever is not published in high impact journals never happened. Satire, right? But um, I want to say that when we interrogate assumptions, one of the things that I've become um, very disillusioned with just in the past year, moving to a very um, esteemed university from a public university is um, the the elitism factor and how it pervades science and pervades what we do and how it undermines deep authentic community engagement and respect for community knowledge. And so this quote sort of resonated to me and made me chuckle. And here's another um, to stop, maybe stop going down the same road we all go down. If you follow these satirical guidelines, if you read the editorial, you'll see them, you're sure to become a prolific writer and successful global health researcher. But remember to train those coming behind you, your research assistants and PhD students to do just the same if you want, if they want to become successful like you. And of course, what Jumbaum is arguing is don't do that, right? Let's encourage innovation. Let's encourage a new direction. Let's encourage that third, third, fourth wave of medicine. Let's look to the um, perspectives of the first peoples of these lands, indigenous peoples, to other marginalized groups, to, to the fact that Black Lives Matter, to make sure that um, prevention science and all science innovates, changes, and does good for all, and not just um, ju those who are already um, who are already doing kind of okay. Um, so Miigwech, thank you. Um, and I think this hands over to, to Alita. Great. Oh, thanks so much to our panel for um, helping us be critical of business as usual in service of the prevention hopes and dreams that we all have. So it's so exciting. So um, uh, one of the questions that came in is for Dr. Williams. So how can anti-racist training help teachers identify um, Black and Latinx youth as more capable? And do you think it would reduce racist bias in teachers? Have you? So I think um, thinking about teacher training is important. Um, I think we still need more science on anti-racist training, what that looks like. And I think the challenge is that 
teaching is complex. So on the ground in day to day, um, you know, teachers are responding and reacting to what's happening in the moment. And so they may attend a training, but in order to actually have a full kind of paradigm shift, paradigm shift um, that might, um, you know, sort of really meaningfully interact their automatic responses. Um, I think it's it's hard to think about, you know, a particular sort of static training leading to um, sustained change. So I think one way to think about training and feedback is through kind of live and interactive sessions where maybe teachers are videotaped and they have an opportunity to get feedback um, on their reactions to students. Um, but I do think it's important to educate teachers about what racism and anti-racism are and for teachers to have opportunities to think in reflective ways about how their own life experiences and assumptions play out in their kind of everyday in the moment responses to students. So I think it's important that we're shifting away from a deficit narrative, particularly for our historically um, sort of minoritized students. Um, but I think a single kind of training, you know, through a, a traditional professional development might not go as far as I'd like to see it go in um, sort of shifting the ways that teachers react to their students in the moment. So Bob, so as you think about this third wave or the fourth wave of um, public health, how do you think about this strengths orientation towards culture, community, and place that Melissa was talking about? Does that like feel consistent with what you were describing earlier? Oh, oh absolutely. By the way, I need to give my, my colleague from UCLA, Neil Halfon, credit, credit for the, uh, the various eras of healthcare. And that's where that, that comes from. But um, no, I think that the, the place associations are, are really profound. And again, when we look at geographic variations in outcome, um, they have, have profound effects and that we, we certainly can't ignore them. It shouldn't, or should we, we should emphasize those as the core of what drives health outcome. Thank you. So much. Um, so um, there's a, a very, let's see, I don't think that we're able to see all the questions that are coming up in the chat. And so I have a very technical question for, um, let's see, Dr. Kaplan, how does the slide on life expectancy account for historic and current redlining of black people, even with a college education? particularly since income levels tend to be equal to whites with a high school degree. So, so they're, they're clearly, they're clearly profound effects of residual racism and that, um, that, that emerges all over the literature. And so, you know, that the comment is really a very good one. I do want to emphasize though, there, there were some interesting findings. I, I really was struck with the, the relatively new book by um, Anne Case and Angus Deaton that got into a lot of detail about you know, these deaths of despair. And they, for those of you that haven't read the book, I really highly recommend it. They, they make the argument that, first of all, they, they have the dividing line of, of having a bachelor's degree or not. You know, it's about, you know in, in the US population, it's about, a, about one third have a bachelor's degree and about two thirds don't. And the argument they make is that people who don't have a bachelor's degree, don't have the opportunity to participate in, in the growing economy. And that it turns out that the deaths of despair really do cluster in, in uh, white, actually white men, but white men and women uh, who don't have a bachelor's degree. And so it's so clearly um, race and, resi and residual um, racism uh, are associated with, with these poor outcomes, but actually they, they do seem to affect also all races for people that uh, that don't have the opportunity to participate in the, in the current expansion of the economy. Thank you. So Melissa, I was thinking of listening to Joanna talk about the um, 
the relational networks. And then you were talking about social connectedness, and precision and measurement. I was um, just curious about your thoughts around precision as you were looking at the way that Joanna was looking at peer networks in middle schools. Yeah, and I think there's a follow-up question I just saw come in that's very similar. How is how is high integration measured and that there's some work okay. on cultural, cultural ethos or who endorsed communalism had better academic outcomes among other things. That's great. Um, I think that there's great uh, overlap uh, or not overlap, but um, synergy in these approaches. So I think social network analyses get at something quite different in terms of the composition and nature of a, of a network of social beings, or in this case, students. And what I think our team is really trying to push the envelope on is um, almost epistemo epistemological um, lenses of what it means to be connected. So not just that you have the people in your network, but how you relate to them, relational aspects, value aspects, and as this comment that came through the chat, this idea of communalism. So um, I think both are very important. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a common thread across all of your discussions was about um, thinking across generations, thinking multi-generational, thinking about the wisdom of elders, for example, thinking across the life course. Um, and I guess any, I guess, to me, that sounds like a way that you're interrogating assumptions of prevention science, which in some ways is based in sort of this, you focus on risk factors early on, and you'll change these things forever and ever. And um, I guess I'd be curious of any other wisdom that you're thinking about interrogating in the so soon that you may have gotten from elders that may have not been paid attention to, like com communalism or focusing on um, you can be both depressed and happy at the same time. Actually, just one comment, maybe it's not directly in response to the question, but I've become increasingly uh, interested in this whole issue of, you know, where we need to begin the focus of attention. And, you know, there's of course been all this interest in, in pre-K or even, you know, um, pre-birth. But um, I don't think that the prevention science has done as much as it, it could in focusing on what happens prior to when people start developing risk factors. There is a really interesting piece that Darwin Labarth and um, Don Lloyd Jones did uh, a while back on, you know, how, how do you bring the number of deaths from cardiovascular disease to zero? And part of their argument is, you know, when for, for the great majority of us, we start life without any risk factors and we get to the age of about 10 or so. Uh, without developing risk factors at all. But then gradually these things start creeping in. And if you look at the epidemiologic data, if you can get to age 50 and don't have risk factors for cardiovascular disease, you probably will, will not die of cardiovascular disease. So something happens between the age of 10 and, and 50 where, where most of us slip into some of those risk factor categories. And so their argument is you really need to double down on the early parts of life. And if you could do that, you actually could have a profound effect on, on ultimate uh, numbers of deaths. Bob, what you're saying reminds me of, or maybe this is what you're saying, but um, the movement towards precision public health and precision medicine. And um, I think that, Alita, to your point, what we hear community members saying a lot is uh, focus more on idiosyncratic differences. And like, if you push that lever, it's only gonna help this group, but not that group. So in prevention science, we historically have looked at average effects models. And so uh, if we can use more system-based learning um, and systems modeling to understand that heterogeneity of effects and um, be more precise, and with Bob's answer, you know, be pr more precise about where the target should occur. Um, I think that that would be uh, a great step forward. And it's happening. And Joanna, any thoughts on that question? So um, I don't necessarily have a response that, that speaks to kind of intergenerational connections, but um, as a developmental scientist interested in adolescence, I think that um, I was part of a National Academies Committee where we released a port, report called The Prom since last summer where we talk about adolescence as an important um, developmental period for kind of intervention. And so for me, I often think about how much we invest in, you know, sort of early childhood and infancy. 
um, as as times when we need to intervene. And and that leads to the, I think, false assumption that if we don't get to people when they are, you know, very young, then it's too late. Um, and so I think the developmental science suggests that adolescence is actually a really critical period for thinking about promoting positive health trajectories, um, ways in which adolescents are developing from kind of a neurobiological perspective. There's still a lot of plasticity and malleability. They often are, you know, sort of fast learners, um, for better or worse, they can learn things we don't want them to, and things that we do want them to. So um, my sort of thought about um, the kind of intersection between development and intervention is we need to, to think carefully, carefully about the long term benefits of, um, you know, sort of interventions during particular periods. I think the science needs to push forward so we understand, you know, what are the right windows of opportunity. Um, and of course, as my panel co-panelists mentioned, I think specificity um, and really honing in on local place is um, an important way that we get there. And one question I'll leave you all as I thank you for being on the panel is, um, is a question that came in, but we're at, at time is to think about how might vocational training and other kinds of training that would occur in high school and in young adulthood, could that be protective like educational equity is for health equity? And is there a place for that as we think about um, the relationship between education and health? So something to think about, because often mostly what we know about is college education, right? So. Um, thanks so much to the panel. Thanks so much to SPR. And that's a wrap.